One of the major issues in banking, of course, is the concentration of economic power into the hands of the people who are allocating these funds. And this, of course, can lead to significant problems if we have a bad banker. As I mentioned in the first video, a banker can create a lot of economic value in society uh, by being a superior risk analyst or someone who is more prudent uh, in the assessment of <laughs> loan criteria. But of course, this, the reverse can also be true. Um, if many people entrust their funds to a particular banker who unfortunately does not make a good allocation of funds, uh, then of course the, bur the burden will be borne by all. First, the banker, but of course, all of the depositors as well. Now, what I'd like to talk about is a much more serious problem than simply uh, incompetence or errors on the beh uh, behalf of bankers. What I want to talk about in this video uh, are what we call <clears throat> control problems or control frauds in which bankers take advantage of their ability to allocate by discretion uh, to pad their own pockets. Uh, insider lending is a serious problem if it's not properly controlled at large financial institutions. It has an incredibly long history, frankly, uh, with several corporations in the 1800s, in fact, setting up banks simply to provide their own working capital. Now, this is not necessarily nefarious, but there are certain lines that people might tend to draw with regards to self-serving loans like the one made by, reportedly, Bank of Montreal President George Stephen um, when trying to help his cousin finance the purchase of the St. Paul and Pacific Rail Line. Um, most of this was not discovered until uh, their co-conspirators actually tried to sue them in court for not giving them their his own share uh, of the proceeds once they had successfully acquired this bankrupt uh, train line and made a quick fortune off of it themselves. Now, uh, much of this was uh, of significant consequence to Stephen, uh, who ultimately left the, the head, uh, the Bank of Montreal as its president, uh, to take up his new career um, working for the rail lines. But nonetheless, this sort of allegations did haunt him for the rest of his professional career. Uh, the amount of money he's reported to have borrowed was, in fact, around $8 million. Um, but if we think back to the purchasing power of $8 million uh, in the late 19th century, the equivalent today would be a, the CEO of the Bank of Montreal lending himself $400 million to speculate uh, in bankrupt securities alongside his direct family. So in these, you can start to see where the lines may begin to be a little bit blurrier uh, than simply a manager who makes a bad investment. <clears throat> in fact, yeah, there was a, uh, <clears throat> a much more serious uh, problem emerged in the late 20th century, roughly 100 years later, um, with the savings and loans crisis in the United States. Uh, and the savings and loans crisis, very briefly, uh, emerged for, uh, out of an issue of <clears throat> having a maximum interest rate um, that could necessarily be charged um, on loans, so what they called Regulation Q in the United States. Uh, and this interest rate cap, unfortunately, uh, was a serious problem. <clears throat> uh, and what ultimately resulted from this was that a lot of speculative money uh, was necessarily channeled from very, or sorry, a lot of money from relatively safe, unspeculative institutions was channeled into speculative real estate investments. Uh, one case in particular that attracted national and in some cases international attention uh, was the Lincoln Savings and Loan Company. Um, <clears throat> in this case, um, the owners of this company actually purchased the savings and loans institution specifically so that they could extend loans to themselves to speculate in real estate. Uh, this type of problem ultimately spiraled not just across one company, but across many companies in the SNL sector, requiring a huge federal government bailout in the late 1980s uh, to the tune of approximately $3.4 billion. Uh, and that was just on Lincoln. If we take a look at the total magnitude of the some, of the sum spent by the U.S. government to bail out the savings and loans industry, uh, it's estimated to have cost them almost half a trillion dollars before they were finally able to clean out all of the uh, bad loans that had accumulated uh, under these sorts of weak governance structures. Now, <clears throat> it's worth talking a little bit about how banks fail uh, and what the consequences of bank failures are. In general, an individual bank failure is much easier to deal with than systematic bank failures. Uh, systematic bank failures that we see across, uh, that spread across entire industries are generally much, much more challenging for us to deal with. A single bank that 
for example, is struck by, uh, struck down by, say, loan concentration in a particular region uh, or a particularly uh, egregious bit of fraud is very different than what happens when we see banking failure across a wide range of institutions simultaneously, uh, as we saw in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. In these types of situations, <clears throat> uh, we often see that uh, there is not enough necessarily um, assets within these organizations or healthy assets uh, to make all of the depositors whole. And so these banks very frequently end up bankrupt and under the receivership. Now, in order to prevent full-scale or uh, economic chaos that would result from massive bank failures across broad sectors of society, what we typically see is governments stepping in to take ownership uh, of some of these bad assets with the intention of holding down a portfolio of real estate and slowly unwinding it over a decade or more uh, to try to manage these bad loans. They recognize that in liquidation, assets will need to be sold for whatever they can fetch in the market at that point in time. But if the government can find assets which it might be able to further develop or simply to sell them at a more appropriate time in the market, then perhaps greater value could be earned from those assets which could be used to reduce the burden on taxpayers uh, who are ultimately having to deal with the consequences uh, of multiple bank failures in their country. Now, this type of institution where the government carves out bad assets from the banking sector and creates a, an asset management company to manage this portfolio is what we refer to as a bad bank. Uh, in the case of the savings and loans crisis in the United States, uh, what was created was an organization called the Resolution Trust Company. Uh, the Resolution Trust Company effectively took control of all of these bad assets um, that had been <clears throat> uh, created through loans by savings and loans organizations. Uh, and ultimately, they tried to find um, commercial buyers for all of these various properties. Uh, the Resolution Trust Company was an interesting sort of public and private function to some extent because a lot of private money was brought in uh, ultimately to take control of these assets. Uh, with effectively the government acting alongside private capital um, to finance the sort of return to profitability of some of these assets or to simply liquidate others. Now, and when you have these sorts of non-performing loans, it's important to recognize that many of them do not come back to life. Uh, bad banks are generally established as money losing operations. Most of the time, uh, a bad bank may carve out say $5 billion worth of assets uh, but then struggle over the next decade uh, to try to earn that amount of money back from the sale of these assets. The goal in a bad bank, for the most part, is to try to minimize the loss to the public stakeholder. Uh, and that generally involves winding down the portfolio of assets over time. Uh, but this can be particularly challenging. Uh, and in many countries, there's actually been significant political backlash uh, against the way bad banks have been administered. So let's talk a little bit about the governance and control of banking institutions so that we can try to understand what some of the best practices are to prevent these kinds of control frauds. Uh, an interesting assessment by Andrew Bailey, who is head of the <coughs> FCA in the United Kingdom, um, which you can read more about in this Deloitte um, <coughs> assessment here, uh, states that it's his assessment of recent history that there has been not uh, that there has not been a case of a major prudential or conduct failing in a firm that did not have among its root cause of failure a culture of <laughs> that manifested in a failures of governance remuneration and risk management or tone from the top um, pardon me for reading that incorrectly i'll take one more run at it my assessment of recent history is that there has not been a case of major prudential or conduct failing in a firm which did not have among its root causes a, a failure of culture as manifested in government's remuneration, risk management, or tone from the top, which implies that there is a lot of organizational structure that can perhaps help to contain or constrain these kinds of problems from emerging. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the important techniques that we have to try to ensure or guarantee managerial prudence uh, is the idea of having independent auditors. And the idea of an independent auditor is that they should be reporting to um, the firm's owners, or at least their appointees, the directors, on a regular basis about what the state of the loan portfolio is. Um, another technique that's been advanced is to 
encourage the bank's manager uh, to become an investor or a depositor in the institution uh, so that they have effectively some skin in the game. The notion being that some of their own capital um, could be at risk if they fail to manage the institution properly. Furthermore, insider lending really does need to be tightly controlled um, given the scale of capital that's available to modern banking institutions. Uh, as a best practice, any kind of loans that directors or executives from the company might receive on behalf of the firm uh, should be appropriately matched to the kinds of terms and conditions they might otherwise get from any other kind of lender. Uh, we are not allowed to play favorites with our own insiders as doing so simply encourages greater risk taking and puts the entire institution at risk. One final piece of organizational design uh, that might be able to help uh, reduce the possibility of control frauds is decentralized decision making effectively not leaving a single manager in a position um, to simply allocate all of these funds so readily without some form of checks and balances requiring a sign off from multiple other officers of the 